like the yeah. part for the course these days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining me. I will, uh, we'll chat for a minute while we have folks uh, getting on to, uh, um, to, to watch and get involved, but, um, I appreciate you taking the time. How, how are things in, in Washington in general with, with the coronavirus pandemic that you're on literally the exact opposite end of the country from me? So, so the good news is I think the, the, the typical rain that we get in the Northwest, uh, it must be sick because we have gone for, we've gone for about a month and I think we've had barely two days of rain in a month which is not typical for, for the Northwest in, uh, in April. So <laughs> yeah. uh, it's been fantastic. The crazy thing is that everybody's yards and homes look better than they ever have in their life because oh, everybody, they're all home and they're just working in their yards, taking advantage of the great weather. So yeah. um, the, the roads are a little empty, which is good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot more, a uh, lot more freedom out there. The, you know, my commute and, and in general, just driving back and forth places, I think we're all going to be frustrated when uh, businesses open back up and everything, because the roads are going to be crowded again. Yeah, for me, you know, it's been it's almost two months, not quite two months since I've been on a plane. And I was thinking the other day that that's probably been it's easily 20, 25 years since I've been home for that long a period of time without being on a plane. So I think when we do get to go back traveling again, I'm going to have to get directions to get to the airport because I'll have forgotten <laughs> how to get there. <laughs> be lost. Well, yeah, I was thinking yeah. the other day the, you know, when when you were were sitting here in the office with me and we were at Barber for the weekend, that was one of the last track events around. Actually, that was it. Yeah, that was the yeah. first weekend. First weekend in March, I think it was. That was the last time I traveled. So, yeah. Yeah. Golly, that's crazy. Well, yeah. uh, folks, folks, as you join, um, let us know uh, where you're watching from and. Um, and maybe how things are going in your neck of the woods. We hope you're surviving uh, quarantine and um, definitely let us know if you guys know of anybody, any friends or family or people that are involved in the track community that are, uh, that are working in hospitals right now that are nurses. I know um, Clifford Robertson, who's an apex pro driver. He went up to New York to help some folks uh, and to be a part of a task force up there that's addressing coronavirus patients. So um, give folks a shout out guys, as you, as you're watching, we want to bring attention to those people that are, that are helping us all get back to the track sooner rather than later. So, yeah. Cause, Cause that's the goal, but um, yeah, excellent. Well, I'm excited to, uh, to have the conversation cause we've talked a little bit in the past on the speed secrets podcast about, um, about the psychology of data. And we've talked a little bit about the kind of mental side. And I think the thing that I've learned so much and so many people have from reading your material is about how to approach driving from the mental aspect and some tools you can kind of use in your toolbox to, um, to change the way you think, change your attitude. And um, we're going to kind of talk about that today with regard to data. So it should be fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, and I find, I mean, I love using data as a tool, but, you know, it's just a tool. And, you know, and it's no different than a hammer or a screwdriver, right? It's, it's what you do with it. And I think so often we, we look at data and we kind of just go, well, all the answers are there. But I think the best, and I've, you know, I've learned this from you and other data gurus that are, you know, I think what makes a, guru, a data user become a guru is they ask the right questions. And I think just digging a little deeper than the kind of the obvious, um, uh, to me, that's, that's what you better use data for. And, you know, not just kind of go, oh, yeah, I'm breaking early. Well, yeah. why? Why are you breaking early? Um, you know, well, you know, to me, it's, it's the whole thing. I mean, drivers don't just do something on account of because, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. there's a reason behind everything that we do. And, you know, sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's, I don't know what to do. Sometimes it's, I don't have the skill yet to do what I want to do. Uh, sometimes it's, um, you know, the car is giving me some feeling that makes me want to break now rather than there. And, you know, so there's always a reason behind it. And if you can really kind of dig down a little bit more and find out what is the reason behind what you're doing, it's a whole lot easier to fix it then. Absolutely. That's something that, that you focused on a lot. And I think so many people have already had <laughs> Ben Rushworth, Rushworth already commented, is a huge fan of Ross, bring back the podcasts. Uh, and, I, and I was just going to say, I think a lot of people, you know, heard you talk about on the Speed Secrets podcast about kind of peeling back the, the layers and, and understanding why 
your behavior is a certain way uh, when it comes to your driving uh, and, and really anything. But why is the, is the ultimate answer that we're trying to, to really uncover? And so that's kind of what we're going to get into today. But you're, you, you couldn't be more right about how data is just another tool in your toolbox. And I think it's becoming more and more to the point where you really have to have it there, but you also have to understand what you can use it for and what you can't. And so a lot of what we're trying to do tonight is kind of expose some of the questions maybe you should ask when you're looking at data and trying to understand, trying to take that line that you see or the colors on a GPS satellite image or whatever else and come up with some questions to ask yourself and maybe some reflections to think back uh, on your driving. So yeah, drivers do stuff for a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, and not always a good reason, but sometimes it is a really good reason. And, uh, but the, you know, the key is, you know, and you, you, you said, you know, what are the, what are the questions? I mean, obviously the first one is just start asking why. And, you know, I used to feel like why was a, uh, you know, kind of a, a negative question in some ways, kind of like, why are you doing that? Uh, but if you take it more as a, I'm just trying to peel back, like you said, the layers of the onion and, and kind of peel back and go, why is that happening? And then why is that happening? And then why is that happening? And if you kind of just keep doing that, uh, eventually you're going to get at, you know, what I say, the core of the onion, what the, what the real cause of the problem is. And, mm. you know, if you can, you know, if you can identify that, Hey, you know what, it's fear that's stopping that, or, Oh, wait a minute, I've got a bad habit there, you know, or geez, I'm just not quite sure what to do. So if you can peel back and kind of understand the why, then it becomes a whole lot easier. If it's fear, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Has, has there anybody, has anybody ever driven a track and not had some amount of fear? I think it was actually, uh, I remember years ago seeing a, a quote from AJ Foyt who said, and AJ Foyt's about as brave as they ever came or come, right? You know, oh, yeah. in the, uh, and I think AJ Foyt said, uh, if a driver says they've never had fear, they've never been scared in a car, they're either lying or they're slow, one of the two. And so, you know, fear mm -hmm. is not a, a, a problem it's just but it's something you got to address and then it's like well how do I address that fear is there something that's causing the fear is it something that's happened in the past is it uh, you know it's because I don't know what's over on the other side of the hill I don't have a clear enough picture of what's on the other side of that crest of that hill mm. uh, is it I don't know whether the car is gonna stick or not uh, you know it's all these things and obviously with data if somebody else got in your car, went around that corner at 10 miles an hour faster, you go, okay, now the fear is now changed to something else. It's, it's gone from fear of, I don't think it can be done to now it's maybe, well, I just don't quite know if I can do that yet. Hmm. But the data is kind of showing you it can be done, which is a, a big help. So yeah. again, it's, it's just kind of digging back and trying to find out, you know, is it, what, what is it that's causing that thing? Absolutely. And I think a lot of people, um, you know, use data for that reason to understand, you know, when the driver, another driver sets a baseline and you go, okay, that's what I could be doing. And I think that's a very, very good reason to use data. But the, the barrier there is that you need somebody that you trust that knows your car well enough, knows the track well enough. That's hopefully a, a really capable driver to drive your car. So a lot of what I like to talk about as well is, there's one, you know, one set of comparison where I can compare to another driver, but also what can you learn just from looking at your own? So it's, and you mentioned a lot of ways to do that. That whole first part of, of your, uh, your comment there was about all these questions you can ask yourself before you even have somebody else drive your car, you know? So there's as few barriers to getting something out of the data as possible. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, uh, I'm probably one of the last people to say, oh, just put somebody else in the car and see what they can do. Because I, you know, to me, that's a little bit like, it's almost cheating for an exam, you know? <laughs> it's like, somebody <laughs> else has got the answers. Let me just copy them. Yeah. You, you know, at the end of that, what have you really learned? Um, sure, there's a little bit of, oh, I've learned that it, I can do it. It can be done. But you really haven't learned how to do it yet. Hmm. So uh, I think a lot of drivers maybe default to the, well, I'll just get somebody else that's faster than me to drive my car. And, you know, it's a bit of a band aid, I think in some ways it doesn't really yeah. get to, to what you're trying to achieve. It's kind of the easy button. I think that was a yeah. Staples commercial a couple of years ago. Hit the easy button. 
Uh, have, have you ever seen a driver that just brought a question to mind and guys, I'm asking Ross questions. So you guys comment and leave Ross your questions as we talk and I'll, uh, I'll make sure to field them um, so that he can, can hurdle over them and keep going and answer all of our questions. But have you ever seen a driver that was limited by the baseline set by another driver where now all of a sudden they have this data from another really capable driver. They're so focused on achieving that, that, having proper technique and really following the steps that they need to follow to improve all of a sudden go out the window. And now they just zero in on, I want that lap time. I want to do that. And maybe they can do it once, but not consistently. Have you seen that problem before? For sure. And I think there's two things there. You know, one is certainly the uh, overly caught up in the, and focusing on the result of that lap time. And they're just like trying so hard to get that lap time that they don't focus on what it takes to get the lap time. So I think there's, there is that. Um, the other part of it though is we all know that there are different ways to get a lap time. And, and you know, some, uh, you know, there are definitely different driving styles, you know, not too long ago I was working with a driver that was competing in a series where, you know, you had two different drivers who could turn almost identical lap times, but they did it in very different ways. And this driver that I was coaching, was trying to copy the one that had a driving style that was very unlike his. Hmm. And it was, well, on one hand, it was good to, I think it's, it's valuable to learn different techniques and different styles, but copying the other driver probably would have been better. It would have been more useful because his driving style was closer to the driver that I was coaching. And um, so, you know, for sure, I think you can just get overly caught up in that whole, just copying for the sake of copying. Hmm. Excellent. Well, so we have a question very relevant to this from Wendy. Um, so when, Wendy, Wendy Moritz says, um, she just sent this to Eric, actually. You got to watch out with that guy. I don't know. Oh, about oh, Eric. oh, okay. Yeah. No, just kidding. He's, yeah. he's great. Comparing my data against a friend's race prepped M3 on slicks when he drives a Mustang. Uh, she says in the same corner, he's getting 1.3 to 1.5 G where I get 1.1 to 1.2 on street tires. Is the G load just a factor of speed through that corner? Uh, as in, if you drive faster, does that develop more G? So our question is, my friend's carrying more G. Is the reason that they're carrying more G through this corner because they're going faster because they're on slicks? Um, well, what first of all, I'd say, Wendy, you're totally, totally out driving that other driver. Like in your Mustang on street tires, you're just kicking butt there. So there you go. How's that feel? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, you're comparing apples to oranges there. And, you know, certainly that the other car on slicks is going to generate a higher G load because they're carrying more speed on that same radius. Um, and it's interesting because I've just been spending a lot of time really thinking about this whole, you know, the radius of the corner and everything. And sometimes we, you know, I, I jokingly say we are G force junkies. We love the feel of G forces. And, in doing that, sometimes we might even, you know, we could we could get, generate a higher G load by turning the steering wheel more and mm -hmm. driving a tighter radius. But that's kind of counter to what we're trying to achieve. You know, we want to open the hands and try to run as big a radius as possible to generate a lower G for the same speed or go faster for the same radius. Yeah. Uh, generate more positive is, longitudinal G, at yeah. lateral G. Exactly. Yeah. More acceleration or deceleration. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, and then the, the whole flip side of that is, you know, we could take a super, super long radius, but sometimes that's a longer distance. And, you know, so we're constantly trying to balance these, you know, a tighter radius means a shorter distance, which means shorter distance, you get there quicker, mm -hmm. but you got to go slower around the corner to get there. Um, so, uh, Wendy, I'll just go back to, uh, you're kicking, you're kicking the other driver's butt, um, uh, on, on your street tires and, and yes, more speed, same radius is going to generate a higher G load. Yep. Absolutely. I, I would yeah. agree. Exact same thing. Apple apples and oranges when you talk about street tires and slicks. So, uh, depending on what street tire you're on, Wendy, you're definitely, if, it, if it's a lower grip tire, you're definitely doing pretty good because mm -hmm. 1.2 on a street tire. That's in a corner is is uh, is not anything to uh, to be concerned about. Well, let's yeah. um let's take a look at some at some data, and this is actually from a driver named Ayrton Senna. 
I don't know if you've ever heard of him before. Ayrton Senna. Ayrton Senna. Senna. Uh, it's, it, it rings a bell. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Well, that's that's good. I've heard he's, he's driven an NSX before in loafers, um, but that's that's all I really know about him. I, I've seen that, yes. Yeah, heard, heard about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I actually, on that, that, that video, which is really popular, if you're, if you're interested, look up Ayrton Senna loafers. Uh, he does some, some nifty throttle uh, input that's very abnormal, but, but has some reasoning behind it. Like Ross mentioned, drivers do something for a reason. Uh, this data is not from Ayrton Senna, but that video, I was listening to the, uh, the Smoking Tire podcast that Matt Farah does, and he was uh, talking about uh, Best Motoring, which was a Japanese car review show, and how they used to race press cars wheel to wheel on around the racetrack for their for their comparison. They wouldn't just test drive them and do one lap and compare the lap times. They would race them against each other. Um, and I just was listening to that podcast going, that is the craziest, coolest concept for a show. But I thought it was worth mentioning. If, uh, if you guys are interested, look up Best Motoring on YouTube because they actually wheel to wheel raced press cars. Wow. Um, I digress. Uh, so we're looking at some data from our driver, Ayrton Senna. It's not actually Ayrton Senna, uh, disc disclaimer there. Uh, and he's driving a Porsche 930, which is a, uh, a rear engine 911, um, an air-cooled 911 with a, with a big turbo. Um, probably generates a good amount of horsepower. And we're just going to look at the, uh, the speed trace here. And I'm going to let Ross kind of steer the conversation for what stands out, because this is a track that you know much, much better than I do. Uh, and is Canadian as well, um, so I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you take it from here, and I'll I'll annotate and, and drive from my end. But yeah, I mean, well, first of all, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park is to me still most part. So uh, it, it is. Uh, I'm going to say easily my favorite racetrack in North America, hmm. just because it is so stinking fast, um, and it's an intimidating track. So when you get it right there. Uh, you can walk away at the end of the day and go, wow, I, I, I did something special today. And, you know, when I'm looking at this, a uh, couple things immediately jump out is when I look at the deceleration rate heading into turn eight, which is at the end of the long back straightaway, um, turn eight is a super fast corner. Yeah. So you're coming up here and, you know, it looks to me like the driver is sort of easy enough to throttle and then getting into the brakes. And, you know, I don't know if that's, so there's, there's immediately I go to, well, why? And two things come to mind. One is turn eight is super fast and it's intimidating. And for that reason, a lot of drivers will kind of go hold their breath a little bit, tense up and ease out of the throttle and coast a little bit and then start to brake. The other is it's a habit. And I think a lot of drivers have a habit of, you know, because of, you know, because rarely do we drive at full throttle up to a stoplight on the street and then immediately go to the brakes. We've kind of built this habit of come off the gas pedal and then brake. So I, I'd say, you know, my first, like I said, I, I immediately go, well, why is that driver doing that? And I'm going to say it's either fear or it's a habit. So if, mm -hmm. if I would look at this and I was either coaching, if I was coaching myself, I'd look at that and go, Okay, I need to be aware of that. So I just need to be aware of how quickly am I coming off the off the throttle and going to the brakes there. Uh, so I see that, and that would be the very first place I'd look at. Mm -hmm. You know, you can almost see, you know, where yeah, where you kind of pointed out the um, that round uh, peak on the sure. on the speed trace there. Yeah, I'll you know, to this. me should be a little bit more abrupt. I will say that. Approaching a very fast corner, uh, I don't. I'm not looking for as a, I'm not looking for as abrupt uh, a peak as I would for a hairpin corner, for example, where there's a big heavy break zone into a slow corner, and you know, especially if it's a straight line. Turn eight, whatever braking, whatever speed change you do on the approach to turn eight here is it's a gentle thing. Uh, you know, this is not a break at a nine or ten pedal. This is break at a you know, it's going to depend on the car, but anywhere from a, some cars, no brake whatsoever. Some, you know, it's like a one brake, just a little brush of the brakes. Uh, mm -hmm. Others might be a five pedal or something like that. You know, in this car, I still, I, I can't imagine any car that you would brake any more than maybe a seven pedal 
you know, where you still have to take some speed off, but you want the car to be very flat and balanced when you approach this corner. And that's just kind of my approach to most fast corners. So again, I would be asking the question of, you know, why? And then I'd start to look at that and go, that looks like a fairly decent rate of deceleration. What do you think, Andrew? Is that's Yeah, it is. I, I think it is for the amount of speed that this driver's carrying relative to what I think from what I know about the car yeah. that it should be able to do in the corner. I think it's probably a, a little much. And and you mentioned also when we first talked how protracted and and long the braking zone is. Yeah. Um, and I think the driver is just kind of underestimating how quickly the car slows down. So the big thing I heard while you were talking was the first step was awareness. And when you see something like this in the data, the first thing you're asking yourself is, am I aware that I'm doing this? So am I aware that, am I aware that I'm breaking this hard into turn eight, which maybe I know I shouldn't be, I should, I should be kind of, I don't want to say breathing on the pedal, maybe a little more than that, but I should be just a nice concerted squeeze of the brake pedal and then a really delicate release and back to throttle soon. Maybe I know that that's what I want to do. And I'm just not aware that I'm actually slowing the car down really substantially, or maybe it's just the opposite. And maybe you're doing this intentionally, but you don't understand what you need to do to get the car to go through this corner. So I thought that awareness component was really big because I think that's a part that a lot of people jump right over because you make an assumption about what you're doing without, without looking at the data and going, okay, this is what I'm doing. Make sure I'm aware of it. And maybe even taking a whole session. Is that something you would advise Ross to go out on track and go, okay, I'm, I'm coasting a little, meaning I'm releasing the gas before I go to the brake. I'm easing into the brake, maybe a little too much. Like you said, for, for this corner in particular, we don't want to go bam, nail that brake pedal. We want to stabilize the chassis and brake a little bit softer, but maybe I'm releasing the gas a little too slowly. And then maybe I'm just staying on that brake pedal a little too much. And maybe I'm not aware of it. Would, would you think it's prudent to do that for maybe a whole session or several laps even to just go, what am I doing with my brake pedal? in this braking zone for for sure and i think you know it, it's certainly one of the approaches and, and i think it's what a good coach does is you know rather than say i want you to break three car lengths later for turn eight and you know uh, it might just be hey i just want you to be aware of how quickly you're coming off the throttle and going to the brakes and i want you to be aware of how much pressure you're applying on the brakes there and nine times out of 10, the driver will fix whatever problem, and I, you know, problem kind of in, in quotations here is, is, mm. is uh, but the driver will fix it just by becoming more aware of what they're doing. And because most drivers kind of know what they should be doing. A lot of times they just don't know what they're doing in comparison to that. Mm. So by asking a couple of questions of what am I doing here? Uh, and, and you know, this is the beauty of data like this, right? Uh, a lot of times a driver will look at that and go, yeah, that's not me. Yeah. You know, that's not me. I'm not breaking that hard or that early there. No, absolutely. Uh, it happens. Yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, there's some, something to that, just building the awareness. And again, data is a great tool for doing that. You know, the other thing I'd say with this, Andrew, is, is, you know, a lot of times we look at data and we go, okay, what are all the problems? What are, what are all the things I need to fix? And we don't spend enough time looking at what am I doing well? Because when I look at, you know, one of the things I look at is the, what I call the end of breaking point for turn eight, you know, where I kind of see the, the, the deceleration rate starting to blend off and into again, the, that's pretty good place. Like this is not a corner where you trail break super deep into the corner. Um, mm -hmm. It is a corner that, you know, with, some cars you can in, carry a lot of speed in before you even start to break, but it's not a, it's not like you've got a trail break into this corner to rotate the car. <laughs> Last thing in the world you need in a corner that you're <laughs> taking at what's a, uh, what's the speed? 190 miles an hour for 90 this. miles an this hour there or something like that. Yeah. You know, it's not like you need to rotate the car at 90 miles an hour. And so what I like about this is that I think the driver's end of breaking point is a pretty good position. And when I look at some of the other uh, places, you know, I look at, um, you know, turn 10 coming onto the front straight, you know, that's, uh, that one could probably use a little bit later end of breaking point uh, to get the car to rotate more there. 
when I looked at turn two, you know, I, that looks like a pretty nice break zone for turn two. So uh, I think it's also important that we look at what are we doing well? Because if we do it well in one corner and you become aware of what you're doing well, you're more likely to do that same kind of thing elsewhere as well. Absolutely. It's, it's that habit of rewarding, of rewarding what you're doing well and, and yeah. making sure that you're just as aware of that. It's almost like when you go into a job interview and they ask you all these questions and you want to make sure you know what you do well in your job interview, right? You want to be able to, and you don't want those things to be things you made up. You want it to be founded on reason and objectivity and things you can prove. And I think that's, think about your, your data as your resume and find those things that you do well and reward yourself for them. And then exactly like what you were saying with the, the end of breaking point, good end of break in, in uh, turn eight, but might need to work on it in turn 10. And guys, I'll, I'll cover just real quickly. I know most, most folks watching are pretty familiar with, with the Apex Pro app, um, but the way Ross is able to determine that is by the colors that he's seeing on the screen here. And we're looking at longitudinal G-forces. So uh, forward longitudinal G-forces is acceleration. Positive is green color. So that's when the weight is towards the back of the car, the load is over the rear tires. And negative is gonna be these red colors. So negative, uh, high negative values, meaning lots of brake pedal, deceleration are gonna be red. Orange is gonna be probably that release of the brake going back towards neutral and yellow is going to be close to zero, uh, which means neither accelerating or decelerating. So what Ross was seeing here was, Hey, this driver's not really doing a significant trail break here because they're off the brake by maybe just right around here where we see that orange change to yellow. And that's some, that's positive. We don't want a deep trail break into turn eight, but Ross, I was curious. So this driver, I've got it stopped right here where the crosshairs are. Yeah. Uh, and where the, where the car is and he's doing 90 miles per hour. And we know that there's some significant room for improvement for this driver on the track. What, what is your, the highest minimum corner speed, whether it was yours or someone you were coaching uh, through turn eight minimum corner speed being defined as the Ooh. slowest speed through the corner at the slowest point of the corner. So I've recently been watching uh, Colin Brown's uh, pole winning lap at Mosport last year in the, DPI car, um, mm. the Nissan DPI car. And man, you need to go and look at that lap, go onto YouTube, find it. And uh, it is one of those, you, you can't, I mean, I'm watching this and going, oh man, like, please stick. He turns <laughs> into that. And, and by the way, there's a good clip in the qualifying session from the TV coverage of him popping over the hill in turn two and the thing kind of wiggles around. And then he's got like four wheels over the curb at the exit and he's just on the ragged edge. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but it's something like 140 plus miles an hour, I think in turn eight. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and and awesome. it could be, yeah, it could be 150 even. Um, you know, I know that he basically turns in, uh, he comes up the straightaway flat to the floor. He turns in with his foot flat to the floor. And it's not until he wow. turns in that he kind of just breathes out of the throttle just a little bit to kind of get the car to tuck in a little bit towards the apex. Mm. And then he's back to full power again to shoot for a squirt, little squirt before he gets to turn nine. So, yeah, I mean, it could be easily 150 miles an hour in that car. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is, but it's, wow. it's fast. And, you know, I, I, I would say that, again, because it's such an intimidating corner, my uh, my my gut feel is this driver could be carrying more speed through that corner than 90. And that's, that's I, first of all, I was trying to find that video on YouTube and I haven't been successful yet to post yeah. it for everyone, but if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a must. Oh, it's, um, yeah. It's, it's, it's so good. You showed it at the instructor summit event and we talked a little bit about, you know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, which I think yeah. is great advice for driving, but also for business and for, you know, anything yeah. you do, you know, we, it, it's, you have to live on that, that envelope. And that's the only way you can push yourself to get better is to, to start getting comfortable there. But um, I think that's an important point about turn eight is you're taking some information. And, and in your case, when we're, when we're talking about, and you say something like, this is an intimidating corner. Um, it's fast. You know, that's probably what this driver's doing. He's, this car can probably go over a hundred miles per hour through this corner, but he's not doing that. And that's more likely to do with you know, him being hesitant about it, not being confident in the car, a combination of different things 
um, that is keeping them from carrying that corner speed. But before you even looked at the data, I would imagine if someone said, hey, would you look at my data from most sport or hired you to come coach them at most sport, you're already going, turn eight's going to be challenging. Yep, and turn two is going to be challenging. And, and yeah, actually, be interesting to look at turn five, uh, his min speed and his acceleration, where he's getting back to power coming out of turn five. Because, you know, the typical thing is that for a less experienced driver, you know, it's the, they drive too fast in the slow corners and too slow in the fast corners. And yeah, you know, you look at turn five here and the exit there looks pretty good on the data. Uh, but, you know, for sure, I think there could be just a little bit more of a, uh, uh, a little bit more, that tiny little bit of green between turn 5A and 5B, actually down in the middle, down right there, you know, and some of this just comes from the knowledge of this track, but, uh, you know, that's a good little, I call it a hustle zone where you mm -hmm. can get back to throttle and give a little squirt to accelerate there. Because then when you get to, when you get to the little break, um, and I don't see really any break for 5B right there, yeah. where to me, you should be using the brakes there to help turn the car. And if we saw a little bit of red to orange there, I think we would see that the car would actually turn rotate and the driver would actually be able to get back to power sooner mm -hmm. because it, it has what I call the car has energy in it. Then if you kind of coast up to a corner, I'm not saying he's coasting, but he's kind of main, maintenance throttle up to it. It looks like. And when the car has got energy in it, when you apply the brakes, the car responds. Whereas if you kind of coast up to it, you brake. there just isn't that weight transfer load transfer that you're looking for there. Absolutely. And this whole section of corners, um, one is also an intimidating place because where, where we see the dot right here, this is already pretty high speed. I, I wouldn't classify anything at motors at most port, maybe except, uh, except five B right here as a slow corner, everything else yeah. is in 10, but everything else is fast. And so this, this driver is approaching this corner as you go under this bridge where my cursor is, yeah. you're releasing the brake and then you're accelerating down this hill. And this, this driver, evidenced by this kind of yellowy, orangey, maybe a little bit of green right here color, he's not really getting back to throttle through here. And Ross, it, it, correct me if my thought process is wrong here, but in a, in a rear engine car, especially one like a 930 Porsche, which is the known to have all sorts of interesting handling oddities if you don't know what you're doing, I would want to be on the throttle there and just plant in the rear end because that's what that car wants. And I think I think we're probably, I think this data, I would be very confident talking to this driver and addressing some confidence issues and talking about what we need to do to put the platform under it. Because it's obvious when you said he's not putting energy in the front, he's not braking here to get it to turn. To me, that says that either he's understeering through there and he's turning the wheel and the car's not going, or he's far enough under the limit of the tire that he doesn't have to put the weight on the front and turn there. And those are both problems we want to address. Right, right. Right here. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I think overall you can see just some hesitation in, in this driver. Turn four, you know, again, depending on the car that, you know, some cars, it's flat all the way down there. And he's obviously braking for turn four. Uh, and, but you're absolutely right. You want to be on power coming down there. So if he's going to do, some speed adjustment before turn four. I like where he's doing it. Uh, but I think after that, as you say, I'd like to see a little bit more acceleration going down that hill because it just keeps the car better balanced. And, you know, the worst thing is, you know, you, I, I see where he's starting to brake. And it's almost, I mean, to me, it's almost looking like he probably still got a little bit of steering in it. If you really stay on it and you attack mm -hmm. this corner, you come around there and the car actually lines up straight parallel to the side of the road before you apply the brakes. And mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, Andrew, does that look like he's using the brakes hard enough there? Because right here. Yeah. So uh, let's take a little bit closer look and we'll see. So when I tap the lap here, I'll get a G value. Yeah. And what I'm seeing here is, and I'll just tap around. I'm not seeing anything greater than negative 0.6, negative 0.6 longitudinal G, which I don't know what tire this car is running, but I'll even, even on period street tires, a 930 turbo would, would decelerate 
a lot harder than negative 0.6 G. So to me, that's, that's probably a six to seven out of 10 on the brake pedal. It's yeah. not a really hard brake. That's more of a speed check kind of brake. And especially because as you come down there, you go down into that compression. You know, you're coming downhill and then it goes uphill, you know, yep. right about where you've got the, the cursor there. And, yep. you know, right in there, that's probably your maximum G load you're going to see anywhere on the track in that car because the car just compresses into the pavement. So you should be able to brake a lot harder there. Uh, so I'd Absolutely. say, you know, again, going back to the, you know, asking the why, I'd say the driver is hesitant. And again, it could be lack of track knowledge, you know, just more laps, getting a more clear picture of, of where the track goes and when they can push it and when they can and stuff like that. It could be um, just some bad habits of lifting out of the throttle. Again, we kind of see the very gentle off throttle and into, into brakes. Um, yep. So I, I, yeah, I'd yeah. say you know, the driver is just hesitant and needs to build some confidence in what the car is capable of doing. Absolutely. It, it is, it's, it's kind of shocking to see at this point on the track, knowing the topography here of being, I don't know how steep uphill, but more than a 15% uphill grade, probably. Yeah. I mean, very, very steep. Uh, you, you don't want to walk up it, uh, when you come to it on the track walk, you know, it's kind of a chore. Uh, and that's how, you know, the car's going to create, it's probably about the same as turn five at road Atlanta for someone that hasn't, you know, from the Southeast, maybe a little bit steeper. It's, it's a steep, you know, and the, the track bottoms out and compresses. So to see only negative 0.6 G here, the, exactly. There's, there's no confidence. There's just that, yeah. um, being really hesitant and over slowing too much. Um, and maybe, maybe, you know, to look into it further, another question, question we could ask, ask ourselves, um, knowing it's a, a, you know, an eighties 911, it's got floor mounted pedals and some mm. people that can be a problem because you're, you're hinging your foot on the floor and pressing the pedal. And sometimes if you have short feet, you end up pressing the pedal on the hinge on the, on the actual support for the pedal. Um, and having driven a, a G body 911, not too long ago on the track, that was something I had to adjust to is those floor mounted pedals where you actually, instead of hinging your foot and, and manipulating your foot like this, you actually have to hinge it and then kind of move your whole foot forward. Um, if this driver is not comfortable with this vintage car and that style setup, that could be something that's creating a lot of these problems that we're seeing. So sometimes it's an easy little, maybe we just need to work on the ergonomics of the car and that get that variable out of the way as well. So that's such a great, great point, Andrew. And, and, you know, many times, but again, fairly recently, you know, working with a driver and was having a problem with braking and brake release. And again, you kind of start asking the why, well, you know, is it, you know, again, is it fear? Is it a habit? Is it a lack of technique? Is it all these things? And then it was like, what if the foot's moving around? And, you know, you look down into the foot well and you go, there's no, and this was a purpose built race car. There's no heel stop. So there is nothing for the driver to kind of support the heel against and then pivot their foot, put a heel stop in and the problem went away. Hmm. So, you know, again, if you don't ask that question of why things are happening, you could spend years going, ah, I just not very good at braking. And of course, then that builds a kind of a negative belief system. Yeah. Uh, so again, digging down and trying to find out what's really causing the problem. Now you can go and fix it. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's cool to see those types of results with that small of a change because it's so often the case with the heel toe downshift. And, and I see that in data all the time. You see a, you know, a longitudinal G starts decreasing and then you see the car slowly stop to decelerate at the same rate. Basically it, it speeds up. If you yeah. were to see brake pressure, you'd see brake pressure spike and then it drop off because the, the driver's releasing their foot off the brake to match the revs. And there's a couple things at play there. One, the ergonomics are probably not right in the car or the driver hasn't practiced that enough. And two, I think sometimes people feel that heel towing can be really, really important. And in reality, braking is really important. Downshifting is kind of just, you have to get it done uh, and you want to get it done smoothly and safely. Um, but that's, that's really cool to hear the, someone was struggling with that. And then that simple fix, you don't yeah. have to, you don't have to, at that point, you don't have to go challenge your whole belief system. You go, Oh, okay. And, and you kind of move on. But um, folks, I, we got a couple of questions that we'll get to, uh, but keep asking questions for us. We'll stay on for a few more minutes here and, and answer questions and, uh, and continue chatting. And then we'll start to, uh, to wrap things up. But we've got um, 
Marlon Sumlin. Marlon, hope you're doing well. Hope you guys are, uh, are surviving uh, quarantine. He said, would Ross suggest that the driver in his next session add one mile per hour each lap until the driver feels he's reached his threshold for turn eight? So that, that, that is certainly a good approach. You do, one of the other approaches that works, so Marlon, I, I, I would say that's a really good approach. The other, the other one that I would use is I would ask the driver, what percentage of the lap right now are you spinning at full throttle? And I would just get the driver to say, you know, and I don't care if the driver comes back and says 30% of the lap or 90% of the lap or 60% of the lap. We look at this and, you know, you look at all that green and you go, I'm going to say the driver spinning 70% of the lap at full throttle. Okay. Then I would say to the driver, I want you to go and spend 3% more of the lap at full throttle. So now going from 70 to 73% of the lap. What that does is, it helps build the awareness. Now the driver is driving around going, being aware of when am I not at full throttle? In which case, can I get to full throttle? Just a little fraction of a second earlier coming out of a corner. Or can I stay at full throttle a fraction of a second longer? And I'll bet you anything, the kind of the, the green to yellow to orange to red at the end of the back straight going into turn eight, I bet that would get shortened up and it would kind of go from green to orange to red. And it would be much quicker because the driver would just be thinking, I want to spend just a little bit more time at full throttle. And that would make a big, big difference with this driver. And I think, you know, what, what ends up happening is you get a, I call them an easy win, right? The driver then goes, wow, look at my lap times. They just dropped two seconds. Ah, and now that gives them confidence to then start to pick up a little bit more speed everywhere else as well. So I think actually Marlon in, in, almost as a, as a combination, either one of those first, but maybe the second would be the other. And th those two things together would make a big difference. I guess the, the one other thing I would add into that is, you know, just asking a driver, I want you to spend five laps deliberately exaggerating how far ahead you're looking. Because when you approach turn eight, it's easy for your eyes to kind of drop with that intimidation factor. But if your eyes are up looking farther ahead, it, your mind kind of goes, just get there. And in the process, uh, that's going to help you get there quicker as well. So combination of those things. And again, this sort of comes back to the, you know, you ask some questions why, but then it's, what are the strategies you're going to use to improve the next time you're on track? Any one of those three right there is going to make a difference. Mm. I, I like those two because that takes what Marlon's, comment was which is add one mile per hour and it makes it a little more granular and more actionable because adding one more mile per hour can look can look a lot of different ways you can add more one more mile per hour by braking lighter you can brake later with more intensity but release the brake sooner and add one more mile per hour you can coast in and go to throttle you, you can do that a lot of ways but some of these you're kind of taking that and going a little bit further and going here's a specific way to do that I like that a lot. And I, and I commented on both of those uh, kind of quotes that you had there. What percentage of the lap are you spending at full throttle and exaggerate how far ahead you're looking for five laps. Yeah. That's powerful yeah, stuff. Difference. Yeah. And, and Andrew, you bring up another, uh, another strategy that works well is, you know, I could say to the driver right now, what, what pedal are you using on the brakes entering turn eight? And again, this, it starts with this. It starts with the question. And I would just say to the driver, what, what pedal? And, you know, let's say we, the driver says, uh, you know, a, a, a six pedal. And I go, okay, now go and do some laps. And I want you to work towards using a four pedal. Because in the process of a four pedal, they're going to raise their corner entry speed by one, two miles an hour. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying don't go in there and break at a one. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, just go from a six pedal to a five pedal do some laps and then maybe a few laps of a four pedal. And in the process, you know, helping the driver understand that now the platform is more balanced and is going to have more overall grip all the way through that corner is going to help the uh, driver's confidence as well. Absolutely. Which again, uh, and sorry to kind of ramble on in this one, but it's a really good no, one. Good. I think is, is to point out is, um, you know, what's, what's slowing this driver is probably lack of confidence and sometimes more knowledge helps a driver get over that confidence or belief system mm. limitation. And if I, you know, spend a little time, you know, I gotta use my, if 
I spend a little time with my, you know, understand, helping the driver understand that uh, my soda stream yeah. brought to you by soda stream. No, okay. <laughs> new um, sponsor for the show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, when a car is like this, it has less overall grip cornering power than when it's like this. So by braking lighter, the car actually has more overall grip to go around that corner. So if a driver really kind of like internalizes that and go, oh yeah, I can understand how a lighter brake is actually going to keep the car better balanced, have the car carry more speed or be more, have more grip going through that corner. And therefore I'm going to be fine. I'm not going to spin off the road and crash and burn. Um, so they're going to, uh, all life is good. Yeah, that's that, there's so many great points that you bring up there, and I think that's that's the all all these things that you mentioned are what I would kind of call an, an intermediate step, which is you're you're here now, and and maybe we look our data looks like the driver we saw from Mosport, where there's a lot of hesitation, there's a lot of confidence issues, and we're trying to get to 15 more miles per hour faster in the corner. We're trying to go way ahead. That's our goal. But if we just look at that goal, it's kind of like going, well, I want to make more money. Okay, how are you going to make more money? I don't know. I want to make more money. Yeah. Does it help to know that you want to make more money? Not really. You have to you have to figure out what the equation is for that. So we want to go 15 miles per hour faster. All those things you just mentioned are intermediate steps. We go, okay, we're braking at a, a seven pedal. It's a fast corner. Let's break at a five pedal or a six pedal. Or, and and then you're you're working your way towards your goal by doing those things. But the important folks to remember, guys, if you're watching this right now and you're struggling with any of this stuff hits home with you, just remember that it's you're not going backwards if you're if you're slowing down the entry to the corner, as in maybe you're braking sooner or you're braking lighter. You're not going backwards in your learning progression. You're not going backwards in your learning progression, even if you go from your driving intensity being maybe at 10 tenths or nine tenths and bringing it down to eight tenths or eight and a half tenths so that you can actually practice these things. That's not a step backwards. That's something that you have to do to, to progress. So you want to take some of these intermediate steps that Ross mentions, which are going to be these, it's a, if it's a fast corner, fast ish corner, break lighter and sooner. And we're talking small margins. We're not talking making a holistic yeah. change, but I think that's a important. That's kind of what I was, again, what I was unpacking in my head when you're, talking about that and what, and what I've so often done reading and listening to, to things that you have said. And I think so many people, you know, that are, are watching have is hearing those really practical ways to implement it. And I think the main thing that we have to, we, everyone watching has a responsibility to everyone else in this sport is to remember that it's not going fast. Isn't about just, you know, grabbing the, grabbing the car by the scruff of its neck and just wringing it out. You know, there's, there's cases in qualifying it, Indianapolis maybe where that's the case, but for us to become faster, a lot of times it's doing these things that may seem like a step backwards because, Oh no, I can break it. The two, I used to break it. The three, now I break it. The two, yeah. well, maybe you're faster if you break sooner and balance the car. Um, so that attitude, I think is very important. It's very substantive. And you're right. I mean, sometimes it's a one step back to make two or three steps forward. And because sometimes you need to take a step back, work on the technique, get it right. And then when you apply it with the scruff of the, by grabbing it by the scruff of the neck at that point, yeah, you're grabbing performing. it with the scruff of the neck, but doing things in the right way. So sometimes it is that one step back to take two or three steps forward. Yeah. We got a question from uh, Zach Shucker. Zach, hope you're doing well, man. Hope the chump car build or champ car build. It's not chump car anymore. I got to get that out of my, yeah, yeah. out of my brains coming along. Uh, it says, does Ross think track time in the rain is a highly use, use, usable, highly useful learning tool? No, not at all. Yeah, no. Terrible. <laughs> not uh, at all. No, no. Uh, it, uh, it, to me, if, every, if I had my way, uh, every racetrack in the world would have sprinklers built into it, and we would always drive on a wet track. And you think about it, like, how cool would that be if all the Formula One circuits had sprinklers built into the tracks and randomly at the beginning of the year, they said, okay, we've got 22 races this year. Six of them are going to be wet no matter what, because we're going to turn the sprinklers on. And <laughs> yeah, so the teams could plan on those ones, but then there are two random ones that they're just going to show up and they're going to automatically, or they're going to turn on the sprinklers. Think about the most entertaining races you've ever watched in your life. They're mm -hmm. always the rain races, right? So 
yes, I think, uh, you know, for drivers who shy away from driving in the rain, I think you're missing just a huge, huge, huge opportunity um, mm -hmm. to, to learn more. Um, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, it's intimidating. But uh, again, kind of going to the, what you were talking about earlier, Andrew, is you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that comes from doing it. Absolutely. And, and the art of racing in the rain, which, which you had no small part in being a part of the movie is a great, you know, kind of, it was, it was out there. It was very popular movie released about racing in the rain. It can't be bad. Right. 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 Um, yeah. No, it's... And, <laughs> exactly. There's dogs involved. Clifford says uh, he love, 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 love in all caps driving in the rain. Um, and Clifford cool. has a, has a, uh, has a Miata, which I think that sentiment is shared a lot of times amongst, amongst Miata drivers and maybe less so amongst people with stock cars or Corvettes or, um, I drove that stock car for a little while, Ross, and I, I drove it in the rain once and I learned uh, very quickly why at a, at a race, when you're racing with the stock car guys, when it rains, they all pack their, their car up, um, <laughs> and diabolical is not a good word to describe it. It was a lot of fun, but, uh, it what was, kinda... uh. What kind of diff differential did it have in that? Uh, it had a Torsen Gleason limited slip, so not bad. Okay, okay. Because yeah. some of those things, they, you know, in the rain, they won't turn, and then they yeah. turn, and then you snap the other way, and yeah. It, it, but, wasn't, it wasn't too bad, but it wasn't very wide tires in the wet and lots of unsophisticated horsepower, solid rear axle with very little compliance. Right, right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want, would have won the race if it would have rained though, because I would have been the only one that that showed up. There you um, go. Yeah, got lots of got some, lots of good questions uh, coming in. Angus Angus says, can setting up the car, Formula Ford in parentheses, with a bit more understeer allow the driver to hustle, air quotes, the car a bit more? Uh, if we're talking in the rain, for sure. Uh, if we're talking in the dry, you know that's a. In the perfect world, you want a little bit of understeer in the fast corners and you want a little bit of oversteer in the slow corners because, again, in the slow corners, you got to get the car to turn and rotate and go. So if you can have a little bit of understeer. Now, in a non aero car like a Formula Ford, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so I think it comes down to a little bit more of, uh, you know, a hint of understeer that is controllable or man not even controllable, but manageable through how you apply or how you release the brakes coming into a corner. So if you've got that hint of understeer that can work in the faster corners, but then when you get to a slower corners, you can still manage that amount of understeer by getting, by trail braking in a little bit more, getting the car to turn and then be able to get back to power still. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if it's just pure understeer, it's going to delay you getting back to power. And, and be very frustrating. Uh, absolutely. It, you know, no, nothing's more frustrating than a car with terminal understeer that, that is very hard to manage. So I like the, the word hint because it's almost like we're building a recipe for the ideal race car. We're going to add a quarter cup of a hint of understeer. And then, yes. yeah. Well, you know, when uh, racing on an, on an oval track, uh, you'll often hear a driver, whether it's an Indy car or a, you know, a Indy lights or something like that, F2000 or whatever, yeah, where the drivers will talk about the car being too neutral and too neutral means mm. there's not enough understeer. Like it's starting to get to the point where it's starting to be so free, a little bit too loose, a little bit starting to head towards understeer or oversteer. I mean, mm -hmm. but now it's just because on an oval track, especially because they're all fast corners, you want just that hint of understeer, just a tiny little bit. But to your point is if it's terminal understeer, you're just going to be slow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's too neutral. I don't know that I've ever heard a, a car described that way, but I can see how in circle track racing where you got four high speed corners, it's yeah. too neutral. You want to be, have a more predictable front end. And if it's, yeah. if it's too eager, it can be, can be a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's maybe a half cup of terminal of hint of understeer or <laughs> just thinking garlic, you know, something like that. Yeah. Uh, for those of you, join in next week for recipes for your quarantine, and we'll discuss that as well. There we go. Yes. Um, awesome. Well, well, let's uh, let's wrap it up, and we'll. Um, this is being recorded. I'm actually recording it through the the Zoom software, so we can post it on YouTube separately, and it will also live on Facebook for those of you watching that want to revisit the beginning. Um, I would recommend it. Lots of fun. Um, so, Ross, what uh, what do people need to know that you have coming up? Um, I will definitely be posting your website, uh, your Facebook page, and that sort of thing. Um, just 
let us know what's going on in the world of speed secrets. Well, with any luck, I'll be going to a racetrack again sometime soon. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I love about going to racetrack when I'm coaching somebody is I bump into people who, you know, whether they subscribe to Speed Secrets Weekly or watch the videos, uh, you know, that I do or something like that. So it's, it's always fun to bump into those of you out, out, at, out of track somewhere. Uh, you know, I, I do have a webinar coming up soon. I just don't have the date and all the details lined up. And I, would, I was hoping I could talk about it here, but uh, uh, just, you know, keep an eye on my social media and or, you know, speedseekers.com. There's a page there of webinars and I always put on what's, what the next one is going to be. Uh, the other thing is right now, I do have a thing going on. Uh, if you go to speedsecrets.com slash zone, and that one's a specific page that isn't on the menu. I should actually put it on the menu, but I guess, but uh, um, right now I've got a thing I call the 30 day zone challenge. And hmm. basically what it is, is I send an email to you every single day for 30 days. And it's trickling out little tiny little things that you can do that will build the right habits or programming so that it will, you will get into the zone more often. Hmm. And, you know, Hey, the mental game is what it's all about. Right. So it's um, everything. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you go there, it's free. Um, I used to, I was charging for it, but through this little period of time when we're all not going to tracks, I thought it was important to give it away for free. So go there mm -hmm. and sign up for that. Um, last thing and then I'll, then I'll shut up. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I look at this period of time that we're in right now and go, well, I, I can pretend this is like terminal understeer and get frustrated by it, or I can learn to manage it and I can use it and I can use it for, to, to prepare. And, you know, things like the virtual track walk videos that Peter Kraus and I do that are on my website, um, asking me questions. I have a regular Q and a thing that I do once a week. I ask, I answer somebody's questions, uh, you know, take this time, and use it to your advantage, whether it's driving on a sim, watching videos, learning to build your belief and confidence like we talked about earlier, all of those things. Just take this time and you know, always kind of aim for speedsecrets.com to be kind of the complete resource. So uh, go to speedsecrets.com, I guess. There Absolutely. you go. Now I'll shut yeah. up. Now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. We'll, we'll make sure to, to check it out. For those of you that, that aren't currently subscribing to Speed Secrets Weekly or uh, have purchased the, the virtual track walks. I've probably bought four or five of the virtual track walk series. And if you want an in-depth look at a racetrack, that's going to cover everything from onboard video to data to subjective, you know, things that happen and things you experience as a driver, you got to check those out. They're, they're really high value. I, I would completely recommend everything in, in the speed secrets world, but I particularly enjoyed those. And then I also posted a link to the, the zone, the speedsecrets.com slash zone. So check that out. I was looking at it myself. It's usually $97 and right now it's free. So uh, quarantine and save as they say in the, uh, in the world. How do you buy soda stream? No, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. The new sponsor, you can, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all sorts of flavors of soda. We'll, we'll probably have a hint of understeer flavored soda. Uh, pretty, it's, it's very tasty. It tastes like, uh, like rubber and, uh, yeah. It's uh, it's really good. So make sure make sure to check that out, guys. Uh, from the Apex Pro side of things, we've got a couple things coming up on Wednesday night. We've got our Chin Drivers uh, Barber Track Walk webinar. It's track walks the wrong word. We're doing a track breakdown, so it's a four part uh, series for four weeks in a row. We're looking at four corners at a time. Uh, so we're going down and kind of just breaking down very small sections of the track. Last week we did turns one through four. This week we're doing turns five through nine. Um, so there is still room for that if you guys want to sign up shoot me a message or something if you drive barber or maybe you haven't been to barber before and you're, you're coming sometime, hopefully in 2020. Um, let me know and I'll send you the link to that. Uh, and then we're really excited to announce that uh, Robbie Foley is going to be joining me to talk about braking. Uh, and I will post a link to that. So make sure to, uh, to click it and check out what uh, you can learn from, from a current IMSA pro and um, somebody who coaches a lot of other really fast drivers. Um, Robbie, uh, he knows how to use the brake pedal and is currently doing a lot of iRacing. Uh, and so he's learning a lot from the sim world and he's been on Facebook live a couple of times and, uh, that should be a lot of fun. There's details in the link. I won't go into detail about what we're going to cover, but, um, we'll cover a little bit. Uh, maybe should you use your right foot, your left foot or your hands for the brake pedal, some stuff like that. It'll be pretty in depth. Um, it should be a lot that of fun. That sounds like fun. I'm, I'll, I'm going to sign up for that one. 
Yeah, Rob, Robbie's Robbie's great. He uh, he, he's very very technically minded, and I couldn't find the video of Colin. I've been looking this whole time while we've been talking. I've been searching. I couldn't find the uh, the poll app at at CTMP. Uh, I'll but see if I can is, find it for you. That's one. That's one you got to look at. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish this recording. We'll throw this up on YouTube so you guys can check that out, and uh, just stay tuned soon for a hint of understeer uh, in stores near you, uh, or shipping on Amazon. Perfect. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.